will be shown you to be for our good. We promise us that. We thank you, Lord. Lord, as we take some time to focus on missions, I pray that you would encourage us, Lord, that you would give us a heart like yours for the lost. I pray that you would use your word, that it would not return void, and you promised that it won't, so I know that is true as well, Lord. Thank you for this book, Matthew, that we can go through it and it goes over topics like this. Inspire us, Lord. Help us understand better how to spread your word. Help us be better workers in your harvest. In your holy, precious name. Amen. Amen. So last week, um, if you were here, uh, John preached a sermon, and they didn't get to record it, so I didn't get to hear everything, but I heard something from everyone I talked to, <laughs> <laughs> which is that he made a point that some people come on Easter and then they don't come back, and this church was unique in that the pastor didn't even come back. <laughs> Sorry, I used your joke for a second laugh, but that's quite funny. <laughs> Last week, uh, my wife and I, my wife actually bought my, my guilty pleasure country artist, and I don't listen to a lot of country, but my guilty pleasure country artist is Chris Stapleton, and I actually saw tickets for him coming to U.S. Bank Stadium where the Vikings play. My wife actually saw these tickets back in the summer, and she snatched them up um, even before I had a position here. And it looked like for a while we were going to have to sell them, but then it worked out with John and with others that we could go. So last um, weekend, my wife and I went to U.S. Bank Stadium with 46,000 other people and listened to Chris Stapleton, and it was absolutely great. But we were at the very top of U.S. Bank Stadium. And I don't know if you've been in U.S. Bank Stadium, but it is a steep Stadium and they have glass railings so that you can see better, but that makes it feel like there's nothing there <laughs> So we're up at the, in, the, in, the, in the top section and we step out and Instantly I am You know like oh That's really high You want me to go upstairs now? And you get up the stairs and there's a little tiny walkway and you're scooting along around other people and you're just like, if one of them, you know, pushed, who knows what would happen. And if anyone had a, I don't have a giant fear of heights, but if you did, I don't think you could sit up there. I think you'd just be like, oh, my ticket will just have to go to waste. But in that moment of looking down at the stadium and looking up to my seat, once I took the first step, it got a little easier, a little easier. That first step is often the most important thing when you have a desire or a goal that you want to reach. The first step is an absolute necessity. It sounds like an obvious statement, but everything that we do requires a first step. Every morning that you get up to work, you have to take a first step or you just stay in bed. When you're going on a, on a trip, maybe you're going to Florida or to Texas, you have to fill up your tank of gas or buy your plane ticket. When you're gonna eat lunch, you have to actually take the first step to go and get your lunch or make your lunch or buy your lunch. Getting here this morning, you had a first step. I don't know if you could remember what your first step was. Mine was hitting snooze. <laughs> and then hitting snooze one more time. And I guess that was my second step. And then prayed and got up and came to church. There's a first step to everything we do. Matthew 9, verses 35 through 38 that we're going to be going through this morning. Teach us 
of the compassion of Jesus for the lost and our first step in reaching them. It's funny, this morning, I, I don't know if you've been coming, you've noticed that I've been taking pretty large sections of Matthew, especially if you've been here since I first came in September. When we were in Colossians, I was taking four or five verses, maybe ten verses at a time. And while we've been in Matthew, uh, there's a couple times where I've taken 60 verses at a time. Well, this morning, because I want to take a month to emphasize missions and because we have Matt and Heidi Keller coming and Matt is going to bring a message on May 5th, I was like, I have three Sundays that I want to emphasize missions, so I'm going to bring this chapter 10 into three messages. Maybe we'll go into chapter 11 too. But where is the, a good cutoff point? And found that from my Easter sermon to chapter 10, there are these three verses in Matthew 9 that are a pivot place in the Gospel of Matthew. Let's read from those this morning, starting in verse 35. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers, the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Before we get into the first step of reaching the lost, let's look at why we should desire to reach them at all. So this passage tells us the first step into reaching the lost, but you might wonder as we came in and we sang a bunch of songs about it and I've said we're going to spend a whole month talking about it. Why? Why should I care to reach the lost? Well, for one thing, it's here in the Word of God that this is a desire of God that Jesus sees that the harvest is plentiful. He sees all of this hurt, all of this sickness, all of this oppression, all of these people who are harassed and helpless and desires for them to be found. This is not the only passage that says this. Actually, this is almost verbatim said in both Mark and Luke. And what it does, how it functions differently, one thing, if you go and find those passages, which if you come on Wednesday, we'll go and look at the, these passages. If you go and look at them, they come in different contexts. Jesus said them at different points in his ministry, said this at different points in his ministry. And that's, I mean, I say things over and over and over again. If you've been coming week after week, you might think, Levi just preaches the same sermon over and over and over again. Well, when we all obey the gospel, then I'll stop. Then I'll stop preaching the same thing. But in Matthew, this verse plays a pivotal turning point. Because it both looks back at what has happened before, and it looks forward to what will happen next. Matthew starts with this long introduction. You know, you have Mark that has this really tiny, short introduction. You have Luke that has this introduction with a bunch of information about the birth of Christ. You have John, which has this theological introduction. And then you have Matthew, which has this four-chapter introduction that doesn't talk too much about the birth of Christ, but gives us a picture of who he is, that he is the son of David, the son of Abraham, the fulfillment of the Old Testament, and that he is God with us. 
And then you have a turning point after the end of the introduction in Matthew 4.23. And let's go and read Matthew 4.23 if you flip back a couple pages with me. You might notice something. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. That sound familiar? It's the same almost verbatim as verse 35 in chapter 9, the beginning of our passage this morning. Well, after the introduction, after Jesus is going throughout all of Galilee, healing every disease and every affliction, he gives the Sermon on the Mount. He gives this teaching, teaching about how he has authority, and this teaching about what it means to live under his authority and in his kingdom. And then to prove that he has that authority, the last few weeks we've been going through chapters 8 and 9 that demonstrate that authority. If you go back and if you haven't been coming and you have the headers in your Bible, you can read Jesus cleanses the leper. Jesus heals the centurion's servant. Jesus heals many. Jesus calms a storm. Jesus heals two men with a demon. Jesus heals a paralytic. Jesus calls Matthew a sinner. He restores a girl to life. He heals a woman who bleeds continually. He heals two blind men. He heals a man unable to speak. Jesus has some power. Jesus has demonstrated great authority. And after he, dem after he teaches it, his authority, and then he demonstrates his authority, now we have another pivot point where it explains that he's been going around and healing every disease and every affliction. And then, guess what comes next? A giant teaching. He gives his next big teaching in the next chapter after this pivot. As we've been looking at this, these chapters, you may have noticed that what these people experience if we believe on Jesus Christ for salvation, we've experienced it too. All of those illnesses that I've just named as being healed, you and I have illnesses too. We have spiritual illnesses. We have physical illnesses. And if you have received Jesus into your heart, you know the great healing miracle that has been performed on your own heart. We know what it's like to be harassed and helpless. When we see these lost people, when as Jesus saw them, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless. We should understand that. We should care because we have experienced it. And because Jesus has given us a spiritual healing like he has, shouldn't we obey him? If he's done something so great for us and then he asks us to do something for him, shouldn't we obey him? Think of it like this. Let's take one of these illnesses that Jesus healed. Blindness. Let's imagine that everyone was blind. The whole world was blind except for this one man. And he had the cure for blindness. And so he came up to you and said, be healed. And your eyes were opened and you saw for the first time. And you looked around and everyone around you was blind. Think about that. Then this man tells you, hey, go tell people to come to me. Give them directions about where I am. Tell them to find me and receive healing, to receive sight. Go. Wouldn't you go? That's what Jesus has done for us if we have received his gospel. <clears throat> And that's what he calls us to do. Now, we should 
care for the harassed and helpless because we were harassed and helpless. But I don't know that we really do. I think that often we don't truly care. And that's because we don't get our first priorities straight. The primary reason we should desire to reach the lost is obedience. We should desire to seek the lost because our Lord who saved us desires to seek the lost. Because he desires the lost, we should desire to do whatever he wants us to do to achieve that desire. That is the primary reason. Now it's true, we love because he loved us first. And even this morning, I encourage you, experience that love again. Today, repent and believe. If you have lingering sin in your life, if you have sin, which we all do, let us turn away from that sin and believe again on Jesus for healing. And he will bring new healing to us. I've, I've been preaching this every week. And it's still true. And it'll still be true the week after this one and the week after this one. If you don't like it, there's the door. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to stop preaching to repent and believe because that's what we need week after week after week. And it's what everyone around us needs. Once you have experienced that, you should desire to reach the lost, but we don't desire it enough in and of ourselves. I went to a seminar for getting ordained. It's a two-year-long process in the Christian Missionary Alliance. And you have to go to four seminars, and one of the seminars you focus on missions. And the district head of the Alliance in the North Central District, Dan Scarrow, who came and preached here um, to welcome me into the congregation back in October, he didn't lead the discussion. He just sat in for the first part. And then he left us with one thought. He said, do you love the lost? And he confessed that he didn't love the lost as he wanted to love the lost. That he didn't love the lost as he should love the lost. And as I looked into my heart, I realized that was true of me too. When I pull up to the gas station and someone else pulls up and I'm tired and I'm ready to go home, I don't really love them. I don't want to talk to them. I don't love them like I should. When my neighbors are being loud, when someone cuts you off in traffic, when you're at the grocery store and you decide to get in the line with the actual person and they take too long, We don't love them like we should. And while I think that love should be something that we should desire, we should desire to love people better. The only way that we're going to achieve that is by following Christ. <laughs> by loving Christ more, by experiencing more of the love that Christ gives to us, even when we don't love the person that pulls in next to you, that cuts you off, that is at the grocery store taking too long, even when we don't love them, we should still have a desire to reach them. We should still be looking for opportunities to present the gospel to them, even when we don't love them, because we want to obey Christ. If we never love anyone of the lost for the rest of our lives, we should still be trying to present the gospel to them because we love Christ enough to do what he tells us to do. If we truly have been changed and Jesus is now our Lord, our master, the master of our life, we should desire to reach the lost merely out of obedience to him. 
You see, God has sheep all around the world and loves them and desires to bring them into the fold, into the flock that he is amassing. He sees the brokenness of the world. He sees the harassed and the oppressed and calls them to repent and believe and thereby receive healing. As our Lord and Master, we are called to obey his command and to participate in achieving this desire to reach his lost sheep. Now that obedience, that will lead to the love that you desire. There's no way that if you go and you obey Christ in this command to go and reach the lost, that you're not going to love the lost then. You might not at first, but eventually that love that Christ will pour into you will overflow and you will become a better witness for his gospel than anyone that you know. If you just would go, if you would just obey, the love would follow. So now what? Sure. Okay, Levi. We should desire to seek the lost. We should desire to be part of this harvest. We should desire to spread the love of God. Now what? Well, Jesus explains in this passage that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. God is the Lord of the harvest. And guess what? He doesn't need you. He doesn't need you. But he chooses you. God spoke everything into existence. If he wanted, he could go and everyone would be following him. He doesn't need you. But he wants to involve you. And from the very beginning of the Bible, he decided to involve us in his plan. He wanted to involve us in his creation. God involves people in the Great Commission. Now, we're going to do something, and I've never named what we do, but we, we do it all, pretty frequently, almost every other Sunday or so. We'll do something called biblical theology. Now, there's systematic theology, and that's when you take an idea, you know, um, you take the idea of the Great Commission, that we should go and reach the lost. And you systematically say, if this, then this, then this, then this, and you're thinking through it logically. And then there's something called biblical theology. Both of these things are good, by the way. But biblical theology is when you go from the very beginning, whatever the Bible says about it first, and then whatever the Bible says about it second, third, fourth, fifth, and you go in the order of the Bible and the revelation that God has given throughout the Bible. And that might be why you're like, why does Levi always talk about Adam and Eve? Well, that's because that's usually where an idea starts in the Bible. When we're talking about the gospel, it starts in Genesis chapter 3, at the fall, and then the promise that the offspring will crush the serpent's head. How many times have I talked about that on a Sunday? Well, it's because we're starting at the beginning. And the idea of the Great Commission, the idea that mankind is going to assist God in reaching the world goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. It says in verse 28, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, 
I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning. The sixth day. God wanted to involve us in creation. He didn't need to. He made it all himself. But he made us in his image to participate in his creation. After we sinned, mankind needed to be saved. It needed to be subdued. God's people needed to be fruitful and multiply and spread across the whole of the earth and bring it to God. And God had a plan for this. He was going to involve his people to do this. And so he blessed a man named Abraham. And he said that his offspring would be a blessing to the nations. That it would accomplish this great commission that begins all the way at chapter 1. And then after that, after the birth, Abraham had his son Isaac. And Isaac had his son Jacob. And Jacob had his sons, 12 sons, that became the nation of Israel. And this nation was supposed to be an example to all the other nations. To bring them all into the dominion of Christ. They were going to subdue the whole world with God. And then one man came and he fulfilled all of those things. Jesus is the fulfillment. And now, as his followers, we spread the news of his dominion. He subdues the earth. First in mercy for all who believe, and then in destruction for all who reject him. Usually, we're, we're talking about the harvest this morning, right? Going back to our passage, talking about the harvest. This is one of the only places in the New Testament that the harvest is not both life and destruction. Jesus is focusing in right now on the life that the harvest brings, that the harvest is plentiful. Usually the harvest connotes or involves this picture of destruction and preservation. All the way back in Matthew chapter 13, or 3 verse 12, John the Baptist says of Jesus, his winnowing fork is in his hand, He's, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff will burn with unquenchable fire. He's sticking a giant pitchfork into wheat and putting it in his barn. And then anything that's left that doesn't cling to the winnowing fork that is Christ will be burned. And what Jesus is saying now in this passage is that his winnowing fork that he chooses to use to gather his wheat into the barn is you. Is me. Is his church. It's Jesus who's doing the gathering. But we're the winnowing fork. He decides to use us. God has had this mission from the beginning. And has used people to accomplish it from the beginning. Now realize, the mission is God's. It's not just yours. It's God's mission first. And it's under his control. It's God's mission that he chooses to accomplish through his followers. Now how are these followers, these messengers, these harvesters gathered? He says, the laborers are few. Well, how are the laborers gathered? Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers 
into the harvest. What's the first step? You have a first step getting out of bed in the morning. You had a first step coming here today. You have a first step in everything that you do. What is the first step in reaching the lost? Pray. That's the first step. Why do we pray? Because it's not our mission. Because it's not us who can convince people to go and accomplish this mission. It's not even us who can inspire ourselves to go and accomplish this mission. It's not us who can decide whether someone can be saved or not. It's God's. He's the one who has the power. He's the one who sends. He's the one who inspires people to go and spread his gospel. And God answers prayer. We need to be continually praying that people would come to Jesus and that people would go. And you should be praying for those in this congregation. You should be praying for those in our denomination, in our neighborhoods, in the churches around, in the world, that God would send workers out from all of those churches to go and reap the harvest. That prayer will be answered. Going a little into Matthew chapter 10, the prayer is answered. Verse 1 of chapter 10. Jesus called to him his 12 disciples. So before he was apparently speaking to a greater number of disciples, and now he calls to himself his 12 disciples and gives them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. That sound familiar? Jesus just did that. And then he gives the power to do that to these 12 disciples. The names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, and Bartholomew, and Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. He called some men. They prayed for workers, and then workers were given. As I've shown you, Matthew 4, 23, and Matthew 9, 35 are the same verse, and in between those verses, there's Jesus' teaching, and then Jesus fulfilling that teaching, showing his authority and healing people. Well, now, in chapter 10, right after verse 935, where it says Jesus went and healed everyone, it says that Jesus gave the authority to his disciples to go and do what he just did. Before, it was Jesus' message, Jesus' authority. Jesus' healing, Jesus' mouth, Jesus' hands, Jesus' garment healing. In Matthew 10, and for the next few chapters, it's still Jesus' message, it's still Jesus' authority, it's still his healing, but it's the apostles' mouths. It's the apostles' hands. It's even in the book of Acts, the shadow of Peter. Healing. He involves us. Paul in Colossians 1.24 said, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, for the Colossian sufferings. And in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I don't know if you remember when we got there in Colossians, but we, you read that verse and you're like, you're making up for what's lacking in the afflictions of Christ? There's nothing lacking in the afflictions of Christ. He atones perfectly for us. He's our Savior. Paul's not our Savior. Jesus is our Savior. What are you talking about, Paul? He's talking about 
how Jesus uses us as his winnowing fork. It's Jesus who does the saving, but he has given us the mission of going and proclaiming that salvation. He has involved us. What? Why? Do you ever realize how much of an honor it is that you have work to do for the God who created the whole universe? He has a mission for you. He involves you. He calls us to follow him. Many times in war, there are messengers sent to go and give a message that will save many men. There's a movie that is all about a messenger called 1917, about a messenger in World War I. It's based off of stories that are true. This character, based off of a real person's name, is Sam Mendes. And he was given intel that across the enemy lines on another location, there was going to be a charge that was going to be met that wasn't going to be a surprise charge. The enemy knew they were coming, and all those men were going to die. And they had no way of getting that information to that army. And so the movie follows him as he crosses enemy lines to go and give this message. The words work his. The salvation for these men wasn't his. He couldn't even force the general he gave the words to to obey him. That was up to the general. But he did play the part of obedience, of going and telling no matter how hard it got. He got some help along the way. He finds supplies along the way. But it was his to go and give the message. So the first step is prayer. But God answers that prayer in having us be involved in the sending out of workers for the harvest. We pray, we send, we fund, we equip, and we go. Five steps to missions for this morning. We've already talked about prayer being the first step. By the way, prayer should just be your first step. You wake up in the morning, pray. You eat, pray. You work, pray. Pray! It should be your first step. In missions, the second step is sending. We send from our denomination. We send from this church. We send from our families. People should be going out from this congregation. They should be going and spreading the gospel. When we're raising our children, we should be teaching them about missions. We should be showing them and no matter where they go and what they do in life, they should be living missionally. We should be sending them into whatever God calls them to, to proclaim his gospel. We should also be funding missions. We see this in Acts 18. Paul gets to Corinth and he doesn't have any money, so he works and he builds tents. For a living so that he can continue preaching the gospel but eventually the ephesian church hears of this and they send him money so that he can focus on the mission we should be doing likewise and we do we should be supporting those we send as a denomination and i'm going to give us an opportunity that these next two sundays not this Sunday, but the following two Sundays, we're going to have Great Commission Sundays. And I encourage you to bring a donation to send to the Great Commission Fund for our denomination. Now, the Great Commission Fund, it goes into the bank, and then it goes to missionaries. 
all around the world, our denomination has missionaries. We're called the Christian and Missionary Alliance. You better believe we're involved in missions. It's my favorite thing about the Christian Missionary Alliance, that we want to spread the gospel. And I encourage you to come and fund some missionaries. Fund Paul and Corinth or his equivalent of today. We are a church that sends, and we should continue to fund those we have sent. Matt, Matt and Heidi Keller. Matt's coming on May 6th, 5th, May 5th. He's going to bring a message, and they're going to sh- tell us about their missionary efforts. We should plan to give funding to them when they come, and we do a good little offering. We should be giving to missions. And even in our families. Look at your family. If there's someone in your family who has given their life to the cause, take care of them. See if they need pizzas. You know, call them today and say, hey, can I, can I buy you a can of pizza for dinner today? <coughs> care for them. <coughs> Provide for them. And we should be giving to other bed admissions. We have a, a few here, but I would encourage you, don't just give to anyone who says give. You want to look and make sure that the money that you're giving is going towards the spread of the gospel. We are called to fund missionaries. So we're called to pray, to send, to fund. We're also called to equip for missions. That's what Jesus was doing with his disciples. He was equipping them. He was teaching them how to do it. That's what I'm doing right now. (laughs) That's what I'm doing right now. I'm trying to equip you so that you can go out and spread the gospel. That's why we have Bible studies. We are called to be doers of the word and not hearers only. If you just come in here Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, and you don't go and spread the gospel, what are we doing? Guys, this is the football huddle. I'm not one for big uh, sports illustrations. But please do not come in after we run a play. You guys come in here and we get around and I tell you, okay, we're going to go do this. And then... I think some of you just go, okay, uh, there's the line of scrimmage. Uh, water. Uh, have fun. And all of us go and do that. Don't we? And then there's no one standing on the line. And all the, the enemy is advancing. They're running a play. They're getting touchdowns because there's no one standing on the line to keep them from moving forward. This is just the huddle. It's not the play. This isn't what church is. If you if you say, oh, I'm a part of a church, and all you mean is that you go to church on Sundays, you're like a man going to the huddle and then going and sitting on the bench after. Our primary goal here is to worship God. That is absolutely true. But unless our worship turns into presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice to God and doing his bidding, which is to go and make disciples, we have failed in the pursuit of worshiping God. Our greatest calling is to worship God with everything we have. And if that, if that does not include going and trying to reach the lost, we're not truly worshiping God. The final of these five things in Involved in missions is going. So we pray, we send, we fund, we equip, and we go. Now there's a difference between living missionally and being a missionary. There is a difference. Missionary crosses cultural boundaries to spread the gospel. Living missional life is what we all should be doing. You guys realize we're at the ends of the earth now? 
We're told to go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth, but we're nowhere near Jerusalem. We're at the ends of the earth. We're supposed to be spreading the gospel. And that can look not just like you hearing someone receive Christ every day, but as John 4.35, Jesus says, do, not, do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for the harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. You might see people receive Christ, but you might just be planting seeds. But be involved in the work. The perfect illustration for all this morning, when in conclusion here, the perfect illustration is the harvest. He's the Lord of the harvest. He's the master. Think of a master of a field, the owner of a field. He's the one who sends out the worker. He's the one providing funds for those workers. He's the one who equips or teaches those workers how to harvest he even provides the equipment and the power for the harvest. He's the Lord of the harvest. That's why we pray. The first step. Let's focus in on that today. Let's focus in on that this week. The first step is prayer. It's his mission. It's the Lord of the harvest who sends, who provides funding, who equips us who trains us, who empowers us to go. It's his mission, guys. Let's go and do his work. Let's pray. God, there is so much in your word. We've gone over seven verses this morning. I think it's one of my longer sermons. Lord, I just want us to love people. I want us to love people the way that you love people. I want to love the lost like you love the lost, Lord. I know that we fall short in that. And so help us to fall back on just obeying you. That's reason enough for itself. Lord, we want to obey you. The Lord of the harvest. What you call us to do first is pray. Help us to pray this week that you would send workers, that you would send us, that you would give us opportunities. Lord, our youth are gone right now, driving back from the cities probably after church. Lord, I pray that you would call them to live missionally. I pray that you would even maybe call some of them to be missionaries crossing cultural boundaries. Lord, we want to be a church that prays for the harvest, sends to the harvest, funds the harvest, equips for the harvest, and goes and does your work. Help us in that pursuit. Holy precious name. Amen.